we got fruit and vegetables, yep. right? Like we, we didn't have chips and like snack cakes mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So like hearing you talk about just that influence is kind of the same. Like if you don't know anything different, it's easier to establish the habits the older you get. Yeah, I would say this though, like the one thing that I noticed too is there, I, I mean, at least for me, Sam, like, and you can go on this more, but there has to be that balance too, because I know a lot of kids that when they get into having that stuff for the first time too, they start just freaking crushing it. You know what I'm saying? So like, I don't, I'm not, we don't really have stuff in my house. Like I like almonds, like realistically, I don't really eat that much crap, you know, but I will say this, like when the crap is in there, I crush it. <laughs> so, so if she, you know, if my wife goes and buys a box, a box of Cheez-Its or, you know, a box of Chex Mix, it's probably going to be gone within, you know, 30 minutes. So, and we yeah. try to take it easy on kind of what we're doing with that stuff. But I think that having that balance for me growing up was big. We were never restricted on what we ate, but my mom did a good job of not putting crap in our house all the time. So like you can have whatever you want that's here, but I'm not going to go and buy 20 bags of chips. You know what I mean? So that's kind of how yeah. we do it, which I thought helped. We'll wait, we'll wait another couple minutes. Sam, I, I got some really good feedback on that. Like a lot of guys, I sent you a couple of texts on some of the kids that they said. So I thought that that was really good. No, good, man. I mean, I think it's such an important topic. And like for me, I, I knew nothing about it when I played. You kind of just oh, eat. Yeah. And I mean, for me, it was all protein. Like I did nothing else. I was trying to get yoked. I didn't know anything. Well, what's crazy is even for me, like I'll go to, like, and I remember in college, like I'll go to dining hall. And certain days, there's only certain meals that you can eat. So you have to actually figure out what you're trying to eat in those days. And sometimes the stuff sucks. Like, I'm not going to – half the time they're, they're making pizza and burgers anyway because it's easy to do in the masses. You know, so I just had a, a four-hour practice and a lift. And instead of going and putting good food in my body, the only accessible thing is, is either a salad that doesn't have, you know, that many – that much, like, nutrients for me to kind of replenish or it's pizza. And I don't know – you know what I mean? Like, it was always – it was crazy. So sometimes when we had the good foods, I actually felt better the next day. Half the time we, once I lived off campus, like I wouldn't even, you know, use my meal plan half the time. We were going to Wegmans to buy stuff ourselves. Yep. But yeah, I used to teach a uh, diabetes prevention class. So we used to have this meeting with, you know, like 20 adults and we talk about nutrition and kind of like the habits and everything. And I'll never forget, you know, we're talking about snacking, like having cravings. And for me, I, I know I'm an all or nothing person. Like I know that for a fact. If I, have, if I have ice cream, I'm getting an extra large sundae with like a hundred things on top of it with marshmallow sauce and peanut butter sauce. Like I'm going in. But I, I know I can't do that often. So I know that I just don't have ice cream. Like I'm not going to get a small. I won't do it. Right. You know, so for me, I just won't have it. But I had a woman in my class who had, she was like, well, if I have a craving, if my husband gets an ice cream cone, I'll just have like a lick of it and I'm good. And I was like, <laughs> what? Yeah, right. I don't get that. Right. <laughs> ice cream cone. I'm biting it. I'm eating the whole thing. <laughs> right. I mean, my wife will take like a small little container of chocolate chips and yeah. that'll cure the craving. Nah, man. Like, I'll rate my kids' Halloween day. candy and yeah, my eat, like, does the same 50 thing. mini Snickers. Yep. Yep. Uh -huh. Nope. If you have mini Snickers, you end up having 10 of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You open them all up at the same time and pop them all. I know, I know how it goes. I know what's going on. Um, we, can pray, we can get started. There's going to be people that are going to be rolling in here and there. Um, so, I, Sam, I know that today we're kind of talking about you do a really good job of this. Um, I used to do it with our guys before you know, we had the gym. But um, we're going to talk about how to monitor our athletes and how to actually know what they're putting in, our, in their bodies. Sam did a really nice job with the athletes about talking about how to get them prepped for their games and how to hydrate their bodies really well. So I know that we'll talk a little bit about nutrients, macro, micronutrients, proteins, carbs, fats, all that different stuff, and then how to hydrate your athletes properly and then how to monitor it. Because for us, um, I don't have to do it nearly as much now because we just do more of the skill work from the baseball side of things. But from the performance side of things, Sam actually requires a three-day log with our athletes um, just to make sure that all of them understand kind of what they're putting in their bodies, when they eat, when the optimal times for them to eat is, uh, when we can actually get them into workout and what they're putting in their bodies that way. And then I, I do want to go over some supplements that, I mean, you guys can use it, some things that we talk about. I think supplementing um, proteins and creatines and things like that are huge. I do want to dive into the topic of multivitamins because I know a lot of people are into multivitamins, but I'm not, not personally for me. I don't know how much I like them, but we can kind of talk about that a little bit more. So Sam, hydration wise, just go through like the general stuff with hydration with the athletes. How much water should we put in a day? Yeah. So the first thing, the easiest way for an athlete to test, and I've done this since I learned it when I was younger, but it's just looking at your pee. 
you know, if you look at it, is it clear? Does it have like a light yellow tint? And if it does, that's great. If it has anything more than that, you're probably dehydrated. And then just making sure that it stays like that throughout the day. Because I think that a lot of athletes have a tendency to not hydrate at all. And then right before or after a game, they're like chugging water. So it's just making sure they're drinking it consistently and, and looking at the urine's easiest way. Uh, and then the rule is basically a half of your body weight in ounces is a good place to start. So if you weigh 200 pounds, having 100 ounces is huge. If you weigh 150 pounds, you know, having 75 ounces is pretty big. And a lot of guys don't do that right now. Once in a blue moon, I, I know we talked about overhydrating. And once in a while, you might see that. Overall, you don't see it often. Like I, I think I did it as an athlete. And I know I have an athlete that comes in here with this huge Gatorade jug, and he probably borderlines that. And for them, it's just a matter of electrolytes. Because if you overhydrate, all you do is you basically dilute um, any electrolytes out of your system, which you need to perform optimally. So, you know, just making sure that you're putting like a little pinch of salt in there can really help because sodium is going to be the first thing that you sweat out and pee out as far as electrolytes go. So if you just take a little pinch of salt and put that in, usually that's a, a game changer. Uh, and then for me, like I, I work with clean athlete and use that to help with our you know, supplementation. I use what's called the hydrate supplements, which is hydration. It's just the lazy way of doing it, to be honest with you. You don't need to do it. Uh, but it's an easy way. It tastes like it's an orange flavor. And it's like, you know, again, it's that sodium, it's magnesium, it's potassium. It's going to be those electrolytes that you're going to miss sometimes. So, again, that's a rare case. Like, I don't think most guys overhydrate. I think it's a significant amount of underhydrated. So, it's probably not the main topic. But just making sure that the guys <laughs> – no, I think I think that that's big. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I know that hydration is a huge thing. I know with a lot of the athletes that we talk to, they they now and then there's a question that they said was, okay, so we have half of our body weight in ounces, period. But that actually that number is going to increase the more you work out. So if you're running your athletes through, you know, a huge workout session, let's say it's even lifting or let's say it's conditioning, like they need to hydrate a lot. Like they really, really do. And I know a lot of times for me, when I was in college, our coach really didn't understand that side of it. I'm not going to, I'm not knocking him, but that was just not his expertise. So we would actually go through a full one hour conditioning on Wednesday nights and we rarely would get a drink break. And most of the time we were so exhausted after an exercise that we could barely even stand. I'm, I'm, and we were really, really talented and in really good shape. So if we would have put more of an effort into like actually hydrating, I think our output would have been better on the field. I remember lots of times going into a weekend tired instead of going into a weekend ready to crush it. So for a lot of times it's, it's what they're putting in their body and how to hydrate. Um, I love this question. I actually want to get into it right away. Um, what are your thoughts on creatine? Um, love creatine. We love creatine. It's the greatest thing in the whole world. What about girl athletes? Do you think creatine for girl athletes are good? And what age would you start doing that? I love that question because this is something that we're, we, we speak fairly highly of. Yeah. So creatine is probably the most uh, referred supplement that we do here. I mean, obviously protein too, but creatine is actually more research. So creatine is actually in research now, I think since like the seventies, we're really starting to get into it. And it, I remember even when I first started taking it, um, maybe 10 years ago now. And it was, there was a lot of heat on it. Like for sure, there was a ton of heat. You really didn't know what kind of creatine you were going to get. Like I remember reading, uh, you know, articles and they were like, Hey, like make sure your creatine's not from China. Cause you don't, you don't know what you're getting. Like you don't know what it is. And I think now the research is all shown basically that like the kidney issues that people were really scared of a long time ago, uh, you know, have all been disproven. And basically it was all cause of creatine kinase levels. And what they researched, basically, so people were going into kidney failure, they, they ended up having high levels of creatine kinase. So they you know, basically were like, well, hey, this must be bad because now when they take creatine, the same thing's happening. Creatine kinase levels are rising. But the issue is, well, now I'm taking creatine. So I'm actually raising those levels pretty much on purpose versus my kidneys not being able to do their job in a normal function, which is why creatine kinase levels are rising. So basically, they disproved that. Um, all kidney issues are, are really not a thing. Creatine is by far the biggest thing that we recommend. And as far as like when we start it with athletes, I don't really start an athlete on creatine until they're six months to a year into probably lifting and maybe they're plateauing or something. But for most athletes, like if you're just starting out as a youth athlete, you don't need creatine. You 100% do not. You just need to get stronger. Your body's, your brain and your, your muscles are learning how to fire correctly and how to gain more muscle control. And you just don't need creatine yet. But when you start to get into it a little bit and the numbers start to go less, 
then you're going to start to see that creatine can help. Um, I think 16 or 17 can be a good rule, but like I've, I've had athletes who were really developed at, you know, like 14 or 15 who've already been lifting for three years or four years. And I don't really see an issue with it for them. And again, the research out there pretty much shows that any of the studies that came out a long time ago showing issues are, are pretty much all null and void now. So creatine has been, again, the most researched out there. It's just making sure you get the right brand of it. We talk about it all the time. We do NSF certified for sport supplements. So no supplement out there is going to be regulated by the FDA. So the U.S. government does a terrible job with it. Don't know why, but they just don't care. If you go to Canada, Canada actually regulates this. But for whatever reason, the American government does not. So I can give you guys a, a bucket of baby powder, and I can tell you it's creatine. And as long as nobody dies or gets seriously hurt, I'm fine. I have no issue, and I just made bank. Right. So pretty much you just got to make sure that you're going to get a supplement that's NSF certified for sport. We work through Clean Athlete, and they've been pretty good to us about that. They're all NSF certified for sport, everything that they do. Um, but, yeah, so I think that works really well. I'm a huge proponent of it. And then lastly on that, just make sure you're taking it right. So when you take creatine, you just want to make sure to hydrate. If you're hitting good hydration levels before you take creatine, you're going to be fine. So if you're already really hydrated, you're, you're not going to have an issue. But for those guys who – maybe lack on hydration prior to it. You really got to up your game when you're going to take creatine just to be safe. Uh, and then when you take it, you have to take it with sugar because basically the way it works is insulin transports the creatine to where it needs to go. So if you don't take it, it doesn't work. Yes, good point too. Creatine monohydrate is the kind because there's a ton of different other kinds out there and creatine monohydrate is the one that's been studied for a really long time. Yeah, so that, this, act, this supplement topic actually gets a really bad rap because everybody that looks at supplements think that you're trying to do something enhancing-wise. Creatine, creatine, like Sam said, just it, all it is is just raising that level. Um, every single athlete that I play with in college was on creatine. Every single one of them, to, to some extent. Um, you know, we were taking, we were a lot of us were putting it within, like inside of our protein shakes at the end of our our lifts if we were doing any type of like unflavored stuff. Um, like it just, it just for me at least, it was huge. It helped me a lot. So I like that stuff. I didn't know this in college. Um, the NSF certified products, we've been huge on. Sam actually got me on those a lot. NSF certified products are the only products that you're able to use in college and professional sports. So for us, we actually have our high school athletes get on the NSF certified stuff before because our goal with all of our athletes is to get them to the collegiate or professional levels. So we want to get them on that same kind of path right away. So that's why we use Bipro and Clean Athlete. They're awesome. Um, they do whole rate stuff. So I don't know if we're BAMFAM, if you guys actually have supplements that you guys can are readily accessible. I can talk to Jake and Adam and kind of get them with our Bipro guys. I think Bipro is huge. It gets, it's a huge bag. I think it's, it's, it's pretty cheap. It's fairly priced. And um, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on protein as a supplement and what age to kind of start protein? Because I know for me, I don't get my protein levels. Um, I don't get my protein levels. Yes, just in softball too. It's all the same. Um, I don't get my protein levels just by food. So I know that I need to have a protein shake to kind of hit that number. So I know we'll talk about this later, but basically with protein, you want to have um, a half to one times uh, your body weight in grams, right, Sam, um, mm -hmm. for protein intake. So if, if I weigh 200 pounds, I need to have 200 grams of protein a day um, or, or 100 to 200 grams of protein a day. I can't get that in food. And in most of the food, it's raw food too. It's raw protein. So, you know, once obviously once you cook it, a lot of the stuff comes out of it. So me, protein shakes are big. One or two of them a day actually really helps that number kind of go up. What age would you start that? Uh, so before going into protein, I just want to touch on like the, the question for softball, I think it's a good question. We haven't really talked about like what creatine does. So creatine, the way it works is, I'm going to get a little sciencey on you guys just because I think it's the easiest way to explain it. So you guys know anything about like ATP and, and all that. So basically what it does is ATP is going to be how our body uses energy, right? So we need it in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and that's how we utilize it in energy. So basically the way it works is it's a adenosine molecule with three phosphates. And basically when the one phosphate leaves, so we end up with ADP, diphosphate, two phosphates. Uh, when that third one leaves, we get this explosion of energy. And that's basically where we get our energy from. So after that happens, we're left with ADP. But when you take creatine monohydrate, you're actually taking creatine phosphate. So basically you're adding a phosphate in. So now you have this extra store of phosphates. So as soon as a, a, an explosion happens, if you will, and that energy is transferred, 
that DP, that diphosphate, can gather another phosphate and turn it into ATP again, so you're going to have energy again. So you're going to see that in the sense that if you do a sprint and you're at 100%, and then you do a second sprint and you're at 100%, and then like typically maybe at the third one, maybe you're at 100 again, and maybe even 102, and then you start to decrease. With creatine, you're going to see that like your force production and strength level stays the same for longer. So basically you can hang, like for working out, for instance, if I bench press, let's say 200 pounds for five reps, but I can only do it for five and the next set I'm at like three, I might now be able to do like five and then five or five and then four and then four again. So I'm going to be able to get you know, a few more reps out of my workout. I might be able to sprint for a little bit longer without getting tired. So you're just going to be able to practice and train harder. And essentially that's where the gains are going to come from. So it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl, the only, the only thing that's going to happen. So there is a little bit of bloating that comes from creatine. Um, it, it happens. There's going to be some water weight that you gain. So for women, just making sure you have that conversation with them ahead of time, I think is really important. I have a few of our females on it and I've had female adults I've worked with in the past who were looking for like strength gains, not necessarily like that lean body, but you want to get a little bit stronger. We would take it, but we'd have to have that conversation ahead of time and say, Hey, you know, if, if you guys do it, just recognize that you actually might get a little bit of water weight. You might have a little bit of blow to you. And if you're okay with that, let's do it. But if not, you know, this probably isn't the thing for you. Cause if they're not bought in, it's not going to work. And I think that's really important. I will say this though, from a skill perspective and an output thing, I have seen a, a steadier pay, pace with the girls that are on it. I mean, especially the one girl that we work with that plays out of state. I mean, her, her output is very, very steady. And, and I think that that's a big thing. We really got them on the protein. Realistically, it's the buy-in thing. I know we talked about it from the very first day, but I think it's easier to get guys to buy-in, obviously. But getting the girls to buy into it, Sam's very knowledgeable on it, so it's an easy conversation because when he goes and talks to a girl or a guy about it or even their parents, you know, that conversation is simple. Like, I'm not going to make you, you know, you're not going to look like a bodybuilder by taking this stuff, but you are going to have a higher skill output, which is ultimately what we're looking for anyway. So I think that that's a big deal. Um, you know, go back into go back into the protein thing. I know that's big. Uh, I actually saw a younger kid on. I think it was uh, Logan was actually take. He was drinking a protein shake on the last group. So what what's your um, thoughts on protein, Sam? So I, to be honest with you, I really don't care if an athlete takes it or not. If I have a younger athlete, if they want to, I guess that's fine. But realistically, if they can, I'd much rather see that come from food, especially because my younger guys. You know, if you're under like 13 you're going to be closer to that half body weight mark of protein. So if you're only a hundred pound kid and you only need 50 grams of protein, like you, you should be able to get that from food. If you can't get that from food, you know, there's probably some issues going on. You should probably just be more aware of that. I'd rather see diet changes in that sense than like a protein powder. Now, when you start to get into like the bigger guys and you're really starting to move some weight and you're trying, you're training and you're playing baseball and you need to recover, but then the protein supplement helps. It's not necessarily you know, a hundred percent necessary. Like me and, you know, me and Jesse who played together in college, we both had similar strength levels. We really didn't see much of a difference. He got his protein from food. I use protein and food. So it really doesn't matter. It's just how much effort are you willing to put into it? So if I know I need, I'm training hard, I'm training three, four, five times a week, I'm playing baseball. I know I need to be in that upper limit. So I need to have probably a gram per body weight. So if I'm 200 pounds, I need probably 200. I think there, there's actually studies coming out right now. And it's too new to say for sure, but they're actually showing that there might be benefits going even a little bit above that. So if you're looking at like a strength athlete or power athlete, who's going to be having 200 grams, 250 grams of protein. It's just really challenging to do without a shake and to maintain body count. Because unless you're just eating chicken all day and tuna and these really lean proteins, you're probably going to get carbs in it. You're probably going to get fat. And now all of a sudden your calories are way up. Now you're starting to gain some fat with it. So for me, I view protein as a great way to get your protein sources without being able to have like really high levels of fat or carbs, unless that's what I'm shooting for. So, you know, it's, it's a great supplement and using it as a supplement, I think is really important, like educating them to make sure they know, you know, it's a supplement. You have the option. You don't have to take it. But if you're not getting enough protein, you know, it's probably a good route to go. Right. That's and great. also last thing too, it actually really matters what type of protein. So not even just the certification. So there's NSF certified and then there's NSF certified for sport. And the NSF certification in general just means that you know exactly what's in it. There's no lying on the label. The certified for sport means that they're actually, they're checking now for banned substances. So you're, if you're training like an athlete, even for myself, like I always take this, the NSF certified stuff for sport because like I just want to know what I'm taking. 
I'm not trying to take steroids without knowing I'm taking steroids personally, you know? So if you guys want to take that battle, you know, it's up to you, but I like to be a little bit more secure with it. So I always take that stuff anyway. Um, if you look at whey proteins, you have you know different types. You have hydro isolate, you have isolate, you have concentrate, you have different types. Then you have pea protein, you have rice protein, hemp protein. Yeah, you have all these different kinds. I highly recommend a whey isolate. So we work with Bipro and we do wholesale through Bipro. So it, it works really well. And they have, I don't know what it is. They have, it's Bipro Elite. That's what we use. Um, they have a different model too, but this one's NSF certified for sport. And it's, it's worked out for us because it's fairly cheap compared to other NSF certified for sport supplements. Like we were with Clean Athlete. We do a lot through Clean Athlete stuff for creatine and for all the other supplements, like even your vitamins and whatnot. Uh, but the price for the protein, it was like two, two, I think even when we reduced the price, like we cut it. So we weren't even really making any type of profit on it. It just, it was still too expensive. Like it was still cheaper for us to make even a little bit more off of Bipro. But now the guys spend, it's like a dollar serving instead of $2 a serving. So they, they really get a lot cheaper. And now all of a sudden I have an athlete who doesn't have to question if he wants to take his protein or not, because it's like 60 bucks for 20 servings or something like that. You know, it doesn't make sense. Um, and then a way isolate, the reason we recommend it is because an isolate takes out like 99% of the lactose. So for guys who might not be, you know, feeling good with dairy, the way isolate is going to be a lot better. It's going to sit a lot easier. And then um, lastly, you're looking at leucine content. Leucine is a amino acid and you're looking for like two to three grams in a high quality protein source. So, you know, you can, you can check brands to see what you guys want to do. We do Bipro because of that. They have like 2.5 grams of leucine and 20 grams of protein. So it's a pretty good ratio for us. But the studies basically are showing that leucine is almost more important than just overall protein. Right. That's big. So I think, I think going to those supplements is huge. Um, I know the big thing with today is talking about how to, how to track it. So can you go into like the depths of how you actually track what our athletes put into their bodies? I think that we can actually do this with our teams. I really do. Um, because you work with a, a ton of athletes and we do a ton of assessments. And once they're, once they're going through their actual training regimens, they actually have to kind of stay on top of what they're putting in. So how do you go through how to track it? And, and what are you doing with them to kind of make sure? And what are you looking for whenever they do track it? Like, what are the things you're seeing? So it's a good question. So I, I have it from two perspectives. So obviously I work with athletes now. I used to do a diabetes prevention class and, and tracking their food was a huge part of that. And we would see them, I would get their food log literally every week for uh, 12 weeks. With the athletes, I only make them track for three days. And then if we see they're having trouble either gaining weight or losing weight or maintaining body comp or something like that, then I'll make them track again. But otherwise we do a three day log on my fitness pal. And for any of you guys, if you do my fitness pal, you can actually create friends. So it's, it's, I love it. It's so easy for me. It was so much easier. Like I used to have a ton of clients when I was just in the personal training business. And uh, it's so easy because I can literally just have them all add me as a friend. I would have them go into the setting and there's a setting that you have to check off in there, but you can make it so that you can view all of your, all of your people's uh, diaries. So you can actually see their logs. So if you want to have like your whole team do it, for instance, you could literally go on there and you could go on, I don't know, Saturday night or Sunday night or something like that. If you got some downtime and you could literally just look at all of their logs at the same time, you can see who's doing it. It just makes it really clean and easy. Um, and then as far as what I'm looking for, there, there's so much that you can look for in it. You know, it really depends on your perspective at the time. I would say like anything else, you're looking to make small gains consistently. So like if I worked with a, uh, like an older adult, you know, who's trying to lose weight, we look at it and I'll never forget it. It was, it was just trying to do the sandwich method of criticism. I'll try to give them criticism every week where I might have somebody who eats ice cream five days a week and they didn't have it on Wednesday and Friday. And I'm like, Hey, that's freaking awesome. Way to not eat ice cream on Wednesday and Friday. You know, it's awesome. Maybe next week we can get it to like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You know, so just making those small incremental gains, I think is really helpful. Um, I don't know what type of knowledge you guys have on like carbs, proteins, and fats, but I always look at how many carbs, how many proteins, how many fats they're getting. Because more often than not, especially our younger guys are pretty much going to be really, really heavy on carbs. They're almost always going to eat just carbs and Carbs are really important. Like that's our main energy source, but guys just tend to eat a ton of snacks. They eat Cheez-Its and they eat cereal and they pretty much only get carbs in their diet. So I, I always look for protein levels because usually protein is significantly lower. So those are just some go-tos. And then overall, I'm always looking at the calories because I need to know how much, much someone's eating and accuracy. You know, last, I could, I feel like I just keep naming stuff, but accuracy is really important. 
there were studies that came out that show that an average person is like two to 300. I, I think I might even be lowballing it, but they're at least two to 300 calories off when they make their food log almost every time. So I know with my fiance, for instance, she used to do it. She's like, Oh man, like 1600 calories. And I like went through her and I made my own diary of what she was doing. She was like 2100 calories. It's like, you're not even close. You right. know, because you forget that when you're making your fish, you're, you're putting in an olive oil. And olive oil is a ton of calories. You forget how much dressing you're putting on your salad and you just add 150 calories. So it's just making sure that people really understand all those little intricacies. Like what you cook in makes a huge difference. That's a, it's like olive oil is a great fat. It's really healthy. But you can easily have way too much of it. Easily. Right. I think that's, I think that's big to note too. Um, I used my fitness pal before you started doing performance stuff. And I was, I was looking at some of the athletes and I remember I, actually one of the girls that works with you now, she's one, she's actually one of the, she's crushing it right now, but um, her name's Gianna. And, and when Gianna came to me, I asked her, you know, what are you eating during the day? What are you putting in your body? Do a log for me. And I literally remember I saw her at three o'clock every day and she had like four Cheez-Its, a granola bar and like one fourth of an apple and I'm like that's what you've eaten since seven o'clock this morning no wonder you're exhausted when you get here at three o'clock and we can't even get through a, a 30 minute session because you're so tired no one and, and there's not a lot of water there's not a lot of fluids going in and so that knowledge alone is a really good talking piece with each athlete um, why are they tired and how are they recovering right so I think that we can actually get them to recover a lot faster when we understand that they're not putting, if they, if they're not putting that much protein in their body, they're probably not going to recover very quickly. So we have to try and work with that. Or if they don't have a ton of energy, maybe they're not actually getting enough carbohydrates and fats that they need to. And, and Sam and I talked about this in the last group. I think this was big for kids to understand is our body actually will burn carbohydrates first. It's going to burn fat second and proteins third. We really don't want to use protein for energy, right, Sam? So we really want to use it as a recovery agent. So if, if we're not getting enough of a supply of carbohydrates and fats in our diet, then we're actually going to kind of hurt our muscles. Um, and that's the easiest kind of layman's term to put it, but you're going to kind of hurt your body that way where you're, you're going to use energy in places we don't really want to use energy. So realistically trying to figure out a way to have a balanced diet when it comes to that is big. We had a lot of kids talk about snacks because when they snack, they don't know what to eat. Um, we talked a lot about having some type of nut, like an almond, um, you know, things like that. I think that's big. I think the first step for you guys from a, from a team perspective is just get them to log it for a week and see where they're at. You're going to notice that they probably don't eat a great breakfast, which is probably why when you guys have your six o'clock practice, they actually walk in like they're, like they're sleepwalking. Um, when they sit in school for seven hours and then they do their homework as soon as they get home and then they eat a quick dinner and get to practice, it's probably because they didn't give themselves enough energy earlier in the day. A lot of times we don't know what they're eating at lunch because they're getting school lunches or whatever. So, you know, maybe trying to actually see what they're eating and actually having them log that I think is a big deal too. So now we can go through the whole day, understand what they're putting in their bodies in the morning and at lunch before they get home. So then when they have that snack or that dinner before practice, they still have a ton of energy to get themselves through the day, I think is a big deal. We said this in the last group, I think this is big too. The kids need to start with, I mean, I, I know for me when I was in high school, I woke up 10 minutes before I had to leave to go to school. So I didn't give myself time to eat. I remember that going to baseball practice meal after school, I was gassed. So I had to like crush something right before practice to give myself enough energy. And it took time where now I actually wake up 45 minutes or an hour before I have to do anything. And I'm able to actually have a nice balanced breakfast. So I have energy sustained throughout the day. I actually have more energy now than ever before because I'm, I'm getting that balance in the beginning of my day. So I think that teaching that to your athletes is a huge deal. Right. And that they, and Sam and I, I mean, we crush breakfast, right? Like, and you'll talk, you could talk about it. We absolutely crush it. It's our biggest meal easily. What thousand calories for a breakfast, but for the athletes, if they're only having a banana and you know, a glass of milk, they're probably not getting enough nutrients to get themselves from breakfast to lunch. You know what I mean? So how are they actually going to have enough energy? And let's talk about school. Like how are they going to be able to focus in school if they don't even have enough energy to keep their head up? You know what I mean? And, and, and food and hydration actually goes with, you know, the brain too, obviously. So being able to get that instilled in them er, as, as early as we can, I think is such a huge deal. They have to go to school at seven o'clock. I mean, for me, I wanted to wake up at seven forty or six forty-five or six fifty before I left. Now understanding that I wake up at six o'clock, I'm actually able to have a really good balanced breakfast. I think that's big. And I know Sam, you can elaborate on that a little bit more. How would you balance the carbs, fats and proteins throughout the day? And what are your, like, you, you talked about having like three to five meals a day. How would you spread those out? And like, what's your big focus on that stuff? 
Yeah, so first things first, every athlete's different, everybody's different. Like, you know, most people I think are going to benefit from having a nice breakfast, but you might have, like, I've, I know if some people, whether it's an adult or not, too, that might have trouble cheating in the morning because they don't, they don't feel good, right? So, like, I can't necessarily, if someone's going to throw up if they eat in the morning, I can't necessarily do that. But maybe that's tied to their night. Like, maybe they eat too much at night. I see this all the time. It's probably the biggest trend I saw when I was training a lot of people. It's pretty much at night. They'd, they'd eat a crazy amount of food, and they'd wake up, and they weren't hungry. It's like, yeah, yeah, you had 900 calories at 11 o'clock at night woke up at six why would you be hungry you just slept you know so a lot of times just making sure that you're aware of both of those things and how that goes together is really big um as far as every athlete like the biggest things you know if you know what carbs do what fat does and what protein does you can kind of figure out when to time it right so carbs are going to be again the, the main energy source so you're always going to need to have some carbs in the morning Protein is going to make you feel full. It's going to be great for recovery. It's going to spare all your muscles. So you got to make sure you're having enough of that. And then fat's going to be uh, like a, you know, one that we don't really necessarily have to try that hard for because I think most people eat too much of it. Um, but fat's really important because fat's going to help with your hormonal balance. It's actually going to be a big energy source for you. And at some point, it's actually an anti-inflammatory. So it's important to get all these things and just recognize what they do. So in the morning, like I, I know for me, I feel better if I have a decent amount of protein and a decent amount of carbs with some fat. So I try to be pretty balanced in the morning. And as I get into it, like if I have, I don't know, more activity going on that day. So let's say I'm working out. Let's say I'm working out. Maybe I'm coaching too because when I coach, I, I'm in a tiny facility right now, and I literally take 10,000 steps because I'm just literally moving the whole entire time as I'm coaching. So for me, I know I need more carbs. Otherwise, I'm going to be gassed. I, it's, a, it's a guaranteed fact. So I try to make sure I have enough carbs. I try to make sure I'm hitting my protein numbers and doing that helps a lot. So what we talk about for the athletes, you're looking at like overall, like 50% to 55, 60% of their diet should be carbs. So it's a pretty big portion. Like it's going to be a significant amount of what they eat being carbs. But I usually see more athletes that are probably like 75%, 80%. And that's usually because protein's so low. So if you get protein up into like the 20, 25, 30% range, you're probably going to be a little bit better off. And then fat usually just kind of comes with it. I don't really coach fat unless it needs to be coached. You know, once in a while, I have an athlete who eats like zero fat. I'm like, hey, like we got, we got to try to figure out some good sources in here. Fat and protein are going to keep you full where I could eat, again, a full box of cereal and feel nothing. But if I have like some protein and fat in it, all of a sudden I can actually feel full. So it's, you know, having that balance and knowing what they do for your body is really important. Again, most athletes get enough fat that we don't have to worry about it, but some don't for sure. So I, I think that's awesome. Any type of meal prep is great. Like I know Sean just mentioned there, any type of meal prep is, is awesome. I talk about it all the time with my athletes because for me, I have my, my, my dinner set every day. I eat the same thing every day just because it's easy. If I don't do it, I'm going to eat whatever I can. It's probably not going to be good. And for my breakfast, I'm in a routine where every morning I wake up and I eat the same thing. So I know for a long time, people used to talk about variety. Variety was absolutely huge, right? You have to eat something different all the time. I'm the biggest advocate against that because I don't think it works. I think people are habits, you know, habits, uh, uh, creatures of habits are. And I think that people don't usually thrive when you say, hey, you have to do something different every single day. It's too many choices. It's too many options. And usually it ends up working for like a week and then all of a sudden somebody's just eating whatever they can. So if you can get into a good habit of eating things that are going to get you going for the day, I think it's really helpful. Um, as far as like the grams too, you know, we talk again about like half a gram or a, yeah, half a gram to a gram per body weight. So if you're going to be, if you're 200 pounds again, if you're looking at me for protein, I'm going to need like probably 200 grams. I'm going towards that upper, that one gram because I work out all the time. If I have an athlete that doesn't, or I work with younger athletes, they're probably fine towards that half mark because they just don't have enough stimulus for the body to need enough protein, you know? So just re recognizing that type of stuff too. An athlete who works out more trains harder is going to need more protein than one that doesn't because you're not getting the same type of muscle breakdown. Right. I think that's huge. Um, I want to go off what Joe said, food equals fuel. My coach in college used to say this all the time. Um, don't piss in your gas tank is the easiest thing that he always used to say to me. Um, you know, you're, you're going to fill your gas tank up with fuel. So, so make sure you fuel your body with the right stuff. Um, that was a that was a big eye opener for me. For your for your car to run properly, you got to put the right gas in it. Otherwise, it's not going to function. So I think that's big for the body. I like that point. Um, Sam, I think knowledge for the kids is big. 
Uh, I understand that we're skill trainers and we're, and, we're, and we're running teams and we're talking about skill stuff. But when it comes to knowledge, what's the biggest knowledge thing that you think? I mean, what do you do with the guys down there? And what do you think the biggest knowledge piece is for the, for the kids to understand? Because Joe said it earlier where, you know, he had, he had his son Jojo go through a full week of, of documenting his food and then would actually take sugar and dump it in a container on all the grams of sugar that he had through the whole week. And that was a big eye opener for him. That knowledge piece right there is probably going to cut out some sugar for him. It did it for me. That's what did it. Same thing. Um, at Canisius, when I was in college, they actually used to have sugar packets on the wall of, you know, a Red Bull, how much sugar goes into it, a Big Mac, how much sugar goes into it. And I looked at it and I used to drink energy drinks before games sometimes. And I looked and I was like, whoa, that's not good. I need to stop doing that. You know what I mean? Because I knew that that wasn't really that good for me. That was an eye opener. So how can we get that knowledge out to the athletes? And what are some things that you talk to our guys about um, in regards to that? So I, something like that, I think is awesome. Honestly, just even having the conversation about like, Hey, you know, I saw, I saw what, if you actually do a three day log with them, you go and look at it, just, just talk to them about it. You know, are you eating enough carbs? And uh, you know, if you go back to that example of that, the girl that we work with, Gianna, she came in one day and I'll never forget it. And she came in for a workout and she was so much stronger that day. Like she hit numbers on, on the strength that I've never seen from her. And I was like, Hey, like what, what'd you do different today? Like something's different. You're, you're going. And she's like, well, I ate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of helpful. Right. <laughs> so for her, that was literally the game changer. And that was her eye opener. Like sometimes you just need to see it. Like I remember I, when I worked with a diabetes friendship class, I asked him a question. I asked, Basically, if you felt different eating chicken and rice versus eating Chinese chicken that's dumped in syrup and, you know, whatever, like General So's chicken or whatever, did you notice a difference? And it was like 50-50. Like, you know, half the people realized it's different. They felt different. The other half felt the exact same no matter what they ate. So for them, they're not going to have that stimulus to be like, hey, I need to eat chicken and rice because I feel great. They're like, well, why am I going to eat chicken and rice? So I feel the exact same eating that versus something that's delicious why am I going to eat chicken and rice? You know, for me, like I know a huge difference in my body. So I'm constantly reinforced to eat chicken and rice or those healthier meals, whatever it is, because I feel better. Like, I, don't, I don't feel that need to want those other things because I feel better. So I think a lot of times when you see an athlete, like if you, see, if you have an athlete on the field, who's just crushing it one day at practice, right? And they're just really energized. Maybe they're talking to their teammates more, a lot of positive energy coming out of them. Just, just tell them like, Hey, you're killing it today. I love what you're doing. Like you eat different, you sleep different. Just try to figure out what they did different. And if you kind of like reward that and highlight that, I think athletes right there will go, oh man, like I got to sleep more. Like I, I crushed it at practice. Coach was in, in love with it. You know, I got to be on top of that. So I, I think that's huge. You know, if you can highlight that, like when she hit a PR, that was huge for her. She's smiling from year to year. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, maybe, maybe I should eat more because I'm actually stronger. I'm probably actually going to see better progress. And, you know, I can say as much as I want. You guys know it as coaches, as parents even you guys can say as much as you want to these kids until they realize it for themselves. A lot of time, they're you're not going to see a change. I can tell a kid all day he needs to eat more protein or more carbs. And until he actually does it and feels the difference, he's not going to want to do it. And we're, and so, we're actually, we're dealing with that right now with one of our, with one of our arms, right? We've got a left-handed arm. He's like six foot six and he's a string bean. He can't like, he, yeah. he he's not explosive on the mound whatsoever because he, 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 could throw, he could literally throw 95. I'm telling you right now, like the guy could be a legit, professional arm problem is is he's literally this big and so but but it hasn't clicked for him yet you know what i mean so we can get as mad as we want at him but until he realizes that his 75 mile an hour fastball isn't going to turn into 90 until he he weighs 50 pounds heavier than he is or 60 pounds then he's never going to know when the opportunities pass him up and he's seeing that you know his teammates are getting college scholarships because his five foot eleven teammate and I'm not even saying weight's a big deal, but let's say his five foot eleven teammate yeah. weighs as much as he does, and his output on the mound is a lot more efficient. He's throwing harder. That's going to be the clicking moment. You know, obviously, as coaches and parents, we want to get that click moment to happen before they have to learn it the hard way. But we also can't force it. So just like Sam said, reinforcing the positive when we get it from them, I think, is huge. So for this kid, for instance, I know that as soon as he starts to to click, Sam is going to be right there saying, "Hey." You see what happens when you do it right? You know what I mean? I think that reinforcement is going to turn, turn the Jets on for him, and he's really going to start to take a, a big liking to it. Um, and I think that that's a big thing for all of our athletes because they want to know what's going to help them get better 
a lot of times we just don't know what to reinforce. I know for me, at least I always reinforced positive skills. I always did that for a long time. But once we learned about this performance side of things, I can even see now the girls that we work with that go to the, that go to the gym, they sometimes even like going to the gym more than they like coming to hit because the gym is more of a environment where they're working on their body, where sometimes the skill stuff can be frustrating. Right. So, so once they get into that habit of really enjoying it, I think that's big. And Sam, I'll let you elaborate on this question. I think it's big. Um, you know, but, but we actually do weigh our athletes all the time. You know, it's funny. We do a lot of our assessment stuff like, and, and this is not uncomfortable, but a lot of the athletes will have to, we do a body assessment with them as well, where they, where they don't, the boys, at least they don't have their shirts on. Right. So go through the assessments and get them on the scale and how you can kind of go over that barrier and things like that. So we've, we've kind of we've played with this a little bit. And, I, you know, I used to work – before I got into training athletes, I trained just a lot of adults. And that's pretty much what I did in my last job. I managed five locations of a fitness center. And I managed the personal training for all of them. So we, pretty, we, we, did, we worked with pretty much adults, you know, with a handful of youth people. But for the most part, it was all adults. And uh, everyone's different, you know. So some, sometimes people are going to get weighed every day, and that really helps hold them accountable. And for – other people, it's like once a week. And for other people, it's like once a month. I'd say what we've kind of just went to as a system is doing it once a week in, in their folder, what we do now in their workout folder. So when they come in, they have their sessions, they grab their folder. The first thing that they do on the first time that they come in every week is weigh themselves. So most of my athletes have a pretty good routine. Like I know Sean mentioned that everybody weighs you know, different in the morning versus at night. So if you can try to keep that time the same, it's a, it's a big, big change or big game changer, I guess. And uh, on top of that, too, you know, what are you eating before? What are you wearing even when you weigh in? Are you wearing shoes or not? Just trying to keep all variables the same is really, really crucial. So, like, if an athlete wears shoes on the scale, I really could care less, but you better wear the shoes every time then. And if you're not going to wear shoes, that's fine, but you can't wear shoes then any time. So just making sure they know that standard. So for our, for our athletes, you yeah, know, they come in, and the first time they're there every week, we do a weigh-in, and we talk about weight. I will say that, like, the guys – most of the guys I have have to gain weight. I have a few that I have to lose, but most of the athletes I have, and like I was the same way in high school, I was just tiny. You know, most athletes are just small. So they just need to gain a little bit of weight. So for them, they don't mind getting on the scale where my guy who's 6'5 and a buck 50, buck 60, he hates getting on the scale because he knows he gets bitched at from his parents and from his coaches all the time. Right. So the last thing he wants is to go on the scale and for me to be like, hey, dude, what are you doing? Why isn't the scale moving? doesn't want it so for me it was actually funny you know coaching it's the same thing that you guys do with your athletes but coaching is it's different for everybody so when I coach him like the first I had to literally let it go for like two months like I would literally almost not talk to him about it because I talked about it so much in the beginning I could tell him getting really frustrated so I backed off for like two months and then one day we had a conversation it was just me and him and I was like hey dude I know things aren't changing for you here's what I would do if I was in your shoes I would just be uncomfortable as can be. I would get so uncomfortable because right now I think you're comfortable. I think you're comfortable with your life. You wake up right before you go to school and you, you live in your norm and you never get out of your comfort zone. And if I were you, I would get uncomfortable as hell for the next like six months. And I would wake up a half hour earlier. I would eat more food and just see what happens. And I think that what's going to happen if you do that is you're going to get uncomfortable for a long time and it's going to let you be comfortable down the road because you're actually going to have a shot. And, you know, for him, he, you know, it meant a lot. He's like, oh, dude, I, that made a lot of sense. He's texting me about it. And he did it for like a week or two, and then, and then he was done. You know, so it's honestly like every athlete's different. But I know for him, that was like the first trigger. So now I got to find the second one. How do I keep him on that? Because every athlete's different. I have some athletes who gain – I've had an athlete gain like 20 pounds in like four weeks. I'm like, hey, yeah, it's probably like too much, too quick. I need to back up a little bit. But, you know, great job actually putting in the effort. Now that we did that, now we just need to make it lean muscle and drop some fat. So it made it easier. So I think the most important thing is honestly just knowing each, each athlete is different and being able to coach them individually. So if you're doing weigh-ins, you know, one athlete might respond really well to doing it every day, maybe doing it every week. Some might not at all. And some you might not be able to talk about, but like, hey, I want you to write it down every week, but we're not going to talk about it until the month is over. Because we're going to recognize, especially like female athletes, you know, due to the, the menstrual cycle and everything, you're going to see the weight fluctuation even more. So you're going to have an athlete coming in through her time of the month and she's, you know, significantly heavier and she's pissed off. Like, hey, I'm, you, maybe that's a tough conversation for you to have with me, but, you know, that's not like, that's not your fault. You can't control that. 
that's not necessarily your eating. That's just biology taking over. I'm sorry. You know, it's, it's the benefit of being a guy. I guess it'll be easier. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, that's kind of just what it is. So I think having those conversations is really important though, because it is different. Every athlete's different. And the way I coach our female athletes is typically a little bit different than I coach our guy athletes because usually our guys just want to get yoked. They just want to be huge. It's a really easy conversation. You need to eat more. You need to eat more protein because how, how do you expect to look like an athlete? Where a female is like, hey, if I eat more, aren't I just going to get fat? Like, aren't I just going to have a belly? I'm like, well, no, that's not, that's not how it works. Not if you're lifting. Now, yeah. if you're actually, you know, developing some muscle mass, it's not what's going to happen. But a lot of times they just don't know. They just don't understand that I'm not going to get huge. Because they look at even, like, female bodybuilders. I had a girl from my school in high school, and she went into the personal training business and has her own gym. And she's absolutely yoked. Her arms are probably bigger than mine. Her legs are super thick. And I can promise you she was on steroids. And I, I know other girls at the facilities that I used to work at who are on steroids. And it happens. Like, people don't think that women take steroids. But a lot of those girls that people look at that are huge – took steroids and they devoted their whole entire life to getting big. It's not what happens to every female who works out. Right. You know, if it was that easy, if even for a guy to develop, you know, mass, then every guy would be huge, but right. most guys aren't, you know? And, and, and to go off that point too, what I, and I, what I really like is, especially with this whole, like, the, the guy, the, especially the young guys, like I think it's easy to push the younger guys to actually get started with the working out stuff and, and to kind of see that progress we, like we said before, we do have 11 and 12 year old kids that we're starting to do the intros, the deadlifting and things like that, especially because we have a coach that's good at it, that monitors them that we're able to. But with the girls, I think it's just figuring out like what they want. You know what I mean? Like I have a girl that the, the one girl we talked a little bit about before who said, you know, I want to play shortstop and I want to hit for, you know, I want to hit some doubles and some bombs. Okay. Well, weighing 97 pounds isn't going to do it. I'm just, I'm sorry. So you have to figure out what's more important. Do you want to weigh 97 pounds and look really good in a bikini for, you know, whatever that's your goal? Or do you want to hit doubles and home runs and have a good amount of weight on you? Not to the point where you're going to be fat, but maybe you're weigh, maybe you weigh 120 pounds and you're strong and you're a beast and you're going to go to school and you're going to compete. It's just figuring out what you want. I think that the scale stuff adds that conversation. You know, where like whenever I did the skill stuff, and I know for you guys, you probably don't just have a scale ac accessible at practice, but, you know, maybe monitoring that and actually having those conversations with your athletes, I think is a big deal because then you understand what their goals are too. Because like for me, you know, I, maybe, maybe one of my guys doesn't want to gain weight. I've got, I've got some seventh and eighth grade kids right now that I work with and they, they don't train at the gym. And they told me like, I, I don't want to be over a hundred pounds. I feel like if I'm over a hundred pounds, I'm going to be fat. And so that's the con it's a conversation piece. Why? I don't understand what's your logic behind that. You know what I mean? Is it because you're not working out? So you feel like everything that you're putting in your body is bad or are you working out, but you just want to stay lean because you feel like the less that you weigh, the more in shape you are. I think it's just, I think it's knowledge um, personally. You know what I'm saying? I think that we just have to give them as much knowledge as we can. I think the nutritional facts label on the back of every, everything is huge. We did that with the athletes in the last group. And we talked about this, like the funniest one that Sam said was the bagel. Like you, when you go buy a bagel, you fully intended to eat the entire bagel, but the serving size of a bagel is half a bagel. It doesn't make any sense. So when that bagel is a hundred calories, you actually have to double it. So I think that knowledge for a lot of the kids is big and just understanding what they're putting in the body. One thing I learned from Sam in the last group um, was that the ingredients are big too. If you have a, if you have an item that has more than like five or six ingredients, maybe you want to stay away from that because they're putting too much crap in it. So, you know, sticking to, you know, items that have a limited amount of ingredients that you actually can teach them how to actually read the, the label is a big deal. I think that that's huge. Um, you know, so knowledge is key. I think that my fitness pal is number one. I think that that's number one on how you can get your athletes to actually dial it in and then talk to them about it especially during this time where they're off and they're not really doing that much. I think this is a great time to have those conversations with them to say, Hey, listen, I understand that we can't be as active as we normally are, but what are you doing during this time? Are you crushing chips and sitting in front of Fortnite? Because if you're going to do that, then you're probably not gonna be able to play shortstop anymore for me. Right. But if you're at home and you're doing push-ups and sit-ups and planks and pull-ups and then you're having good meals, well, you might go from being my third baseman to my shortstop then, you know what I'm saying? So having those conversations with them, I think is a big deal. Um, it's going to teach them a lot. So, Sam, I know you got some other things you want to go into for sure. So, um, what are the big things you want to touch on before we close this up? Yeah, so I think that's huge, though, too, is, you know, just recognizing, again, just how important actual coaching is. 
Like every, every athlete is different. It's really important, I think, to talk to those type of people because it's different. Every athlete goes through different things. And, and unfortunately, I think when people think about what an athlete, you know, is, for whatever reason, like if you look at – if you ask a kid what being fit means, right, they just want to show you this picture of someone who's absolutely yoked and shredded with an eight pack. And that's not necessarily the case. Like, that's not what we're trying to teach. Because even if you look at, you know, we live, it's a toxic culture, right? Especially for females. Instagram is so popular right now. TikTok is huge. And you see these girls who all they do all day is watch other girls and look at other girls who may be fit and maybe, you know, attractive to them. And they're always comparing themselves. So I think number one, it's kind of educating themselves to like, you know, we talked about it the other day, but if I have a female athlete, I'll ask her, like, you know, what's – okay, do you have a – I know we talked about the shortstop. Because I've had a female athlete, and I'm like, hey, what softball player do you look up to? That's I mean, Let me see a picture of her. And she shows me a picture. I'm like, all right, so do you see the difference between you and her? Her legs are thick and strong, and yours are, like, this big. You know, there, there's an issue here. And it's not necessarily, like, you don't have to have a six-pack to be fit. You have to be strong, though, and you have to be fast. You have to feel good. And typically, if you look at any type of guy, like, again, for guys, all those dudes on, on magazine covers and whatnot, they have a shredded eight-pack, and they literally dedicated the last, you know, six weeks to that body. They haven't eaten anything. They literally have no water in their system, so they're dehydrated as can be just so they look good for a picture. And that's not the realistic athletic body that we're looking for out of our athletes. So I think talking about that stuff is really big. Um, and then again, talking about the labels, I think are really big. Like, I don't know if you guys pay attention to labels all that much, but labels are really big. A lot of people shop and they don't look at them at all. And I know for me and my fiance, if she's like questioning something, she'll literally just throw it to me and I'll check the label and be like, Hey, you know, it looks like a decent product. Let's do it. Um, and then the last thing that I do is when we coach, I'm not looking for perfection. I don't, I don't think it's healthy. I think if you want to be a bodybuilder and you want to be absolutely perfect, then maybe that's your realm. But for most athletes, you know, if you can get 80% of your food really healthy, really solid, you know, good nutrition, I'm happy with that. If you can go the 80-20 rule is something I live by personally. So 80% of my food is really healthy and 20% I got a little bit of leeway with it. And I teach the same thing. You know, it's okay if you have Cheez-Its, but, you know, if you have Cheez-Its and fruit roll-ups and, you know, greasy puff cereal – now all of a sudden that, that 80% is like 60% or maybe 50%, maybe even 40 or 30%. So if you can just get 80% of your food really good, I'm, I'm really happy with that. Uh, and then pregame and postgame, you know, what you should do I think is really crucial. We already touched on that. So pregame, it's really important that you're going to have some sort of carb that's going to be uh, light. So you don't want a heavy carb. Something with a ton of fiber, for instance, is really good outside of playing but you're not going to want a ton of fiber right before you play a game. So your stomach's probably not going to feel great. So just educating kids, like there's a difference between what you should be doing all the time. If you have all those simple carbs, which are like sugary carbohydrates, your energy is going to fly up really fast. And then it's going to fly right back down and you're going to be absolutely shot and you're going to need more food and then you're going to eat. And it's going to be a cycle of basically it's highs and lows. So if you can most of the time eat those complex carbohydrates, like, you know, your whole grains, for instance, like 100% whole grains, you're going to get that more delayed, steady type of carbohydrates, steady energy. So you're actually going to feel pretty good. But pregame and postgame or post-workout, you want like a quicker digesting carb. You just used a lot of carbs. Your body's low on it now. So you actually need to replenish it pretty quick. So it's not terrible to have something that's going to digest a little bit quicker after a game or even before a game because, again, it's going to be lighter on your stomach. So I think knowing those type of things is really important. Um, you know, protein, really important post-game, not really that important pre-game. You have a little bit that's great. Fat can sit a little bit heavier, so typically you don't want a lot pre-game. Even post-game, you don't really want much because you want your body to absorb protein, so you don't want to focus too much on fat. But I see a lot of issues with pre-game meals. I, mean, I see a lot of it where people eat really heavy or they don't eat at all. So trying to find that, that good medium of not just stopping at Burger King and getting something on the way to the game but actually getting something that's going to fuel them up to play. It's just like, I, I don't know. I haven't had fast food in probably, I don't even know, 11 or 12 years now. I, get, I gave it up a long time ago. and something I, I won't do now just out of principle. I haven't done it for 12 years. I'm not going to start now. I don't want to develop that type of habit. But, you know, if you eat something like that, that's heavy. Like, that's, that's heavy food. You're looking at fats and grease, and that's not going to sit good. How do you expect to go sprint and then recover and then sprint again and then recover and then sprint again after having, like, McDonald's or Burger King? 
it's not gonna. I'm not gonna get the best athlete. I might get you at your B level. Or you might be decent if you're a good enough athlete. That might be acceptable. But if I can get an athlete to their A level because now they're eating good and they're actually taking care of their body, I, you know, it's huge. I think it's just educating them. Like even if they're a good athlete on your team, if they eat better, they're gonna be a better athlete. They're gonna actually feel their body. You can only do so much if your car. Again, if the engine's broke, you're not gonna. It's not gonna drive well. You know, if, if you don't have that energy, that engine. It's not going to do anything. You have the best body, but if you don't have the energy to use it, it doesn't matter. And that happens when people get depleted. That have, If you're looking at like double, triple headers, you know, making sure that you're getting enough carbs in between games is really important. It's actually, it's like crucial. If you have carbs every two or three hours or even like intra games during the games, I think it's really important. That can be from a Gatorade. We talked about diluting Gatorades just because they're, they're so sugary. Uh, if you dilute it, though, and have it over the course of, like, two games, all of a sudden, maybe it's a viable option. You get your electrolytes, you get some sugar, some carbs, you're going to get that energy. Yeah, I think that's I think that's important. I think it's really important. We're kind of getting short on, short on time here. So I just really think at the end of the day, understanding that we're going to use carbs first, fat second, protein third is big, protein is going to help us recover, and then actually logging it with your athletes. Know what their goals are. You know, you're going to get 13-year-old guys that are going to say, oh, I want these huge muscles. Okay, great. So then let's start eating and let's start getting you in the gym and let's get you stronger. But for the girls, obviously that conversation is a little more touchy. So let's have that conversation with who do you like athlete-wise? You know, we talked yesterday about the, the shortstop at, at uh, I think, uh, Cis, is it Sis Bates? Yeah. Yeah, like she's an absolute beast. So, like, if I, got a, short, if I got a shortstop that wants to be like her, okay, great, look at her. Because if you standing next to her, she's going to make you look like you're three years old. So you might yeah. want to figure that out a little bit. So even though she's an absolute freak athlete, she, she does take a lot of time to put into her body. Um, and, and I'll get into a small story before we close this up. But I got a kid who's at the University of Alabama. Uh, he's a freshman there. He was He's top 20 in the country for the draft in a couple of years. But when he was in high school, he's an absolute freak athlete. But it's like 6'3", like 180, 190. So like it was a, he was a doubles machine. Right. And he kept saying to me, I don't know why I can't hit the ball over the fence. It's my swing. It's my swing. It's my swing. I said, no, dude, you just haven't, you just haven't hit your man strength yet. You just haven't gotten strong enough yet. He goes to Alabama. Obviously they got one of the greatest, you know, uh, strength conditioning programs in the country. He leaves there in the fall and he's two, two fifteen, two twenty. coming out, coming out this year. Now it's home run, all those doubles. He's not hitting doubles anymore. The ball's leaving the yard. So it's bomb, 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 bomb. It has nothing to do with the swing. And this is what I learned. Like, I'm a skill guy. Like, I learned that it really does come down to how you're feeling your body and what you're doing strength and conditioning-wise is where you get those athletes to take that next step. I already The, the kid's already enough, a, a talent, t- talented enough to play in the SEC, but what's going to make him a pro and what's going to make him play every day, that was the separator. And when he eats, I don't even want to eat with him because he's going he's gonna to embarrass me because of the amount of food that he's going to eat. So I think for him, the biggest thing was – getting into that program where he's actually going to be able to work out properly and do the right stuff. And then now that he's fueling his body properly, I think that that helps him a lot. So at the end of the day, if you want your athletes to take that next step, it's the fuel that they're putting in their body and how they're using that fuel for, for performance. So um, if you guys have any questions about any of the nutritional stuff, we do a lot of it um, kind of in-house. So if you guys have any questions about it, um, I'll put it in the chat before we go hot corner performance center at Gmail. Sam is open right now. A lot of the athletes are going to be reaching out to him about stuff. I'll write this in here in a second, but um, if you guys have anything else, just please let us know. And I know tomorrow we're talking about speed and, and things like that. And kind of, that'll kind of tie into the base running stuff. So Sam, if you got anything closing, um, you know, go ahead, but I'm going to write this in here now before we close up. Yeah. I mean, the last thing I want to say, just on what you were saying, and I know um, the guy from Alabama, he's, he's shredded. He had like an APAC, absolutely just ripped. And I think that the biggest mistake I see from from guys, from our male athletes, is they look at athletes again like that and they just want to be absolutely shredded. But you're, you're not going to usually perform optimally at like 6 to 8 body percent, at 6 to 8 percent. You're just not. Right. If you go up to like 10 percent, 12 percent, where you're maybe not shredded, maybe there's you, know, you can see a little bit of it, you're probably going to perform a lot better. So it's just recognizing like, I don't need you to be a bodybuilder. You don't need to be absolutely jacked. I need you to produce power. I need you to feel good. I need you to be able to recover. And that's more important to me than what you look like. So even having that conversation just so they can value that and prioritize that is really important. Like I know I have an athlete who maybe he'll play college baseball. He's not really sure. And he's got like an eight pack. And I'm sure he gets complimented by the ladies. And to him, that's more important. And he prioritizes that. And like for me, I, I, if that's his you know, choice, I can't change his mind. You know, we're going to work with it as best we can, but I know he's probably not going to get above 60, like above 160. 
he's too shredded, man. He just looks too good. He doesn't want to lose that. But right. I know I didn't get to some of the questions in the chat too. So guys, yeah, definitely shoot me an email. Um, I'll be on that throughout the course in the next like 24 hours, you know. So if you have anything or you have more things that we didn't necessarily touch on, just shoot them my way. And if you guys even have stuff that you guys want to talk about for speed tomorrow or speed and agility, uh, you know, you can send that so that I know going into it, I, I have some guidelines on what to talk about. So, yeah, just shoot me an email. That's big. We appreciate it. Um, we'll get into that tomorrow. So, thank you, guys. Appreciate you, you guys. See you later. See you.